thank you so much for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be back in Canada. I am Toronto raised, uh, and to be visiting London and the University of Western Ontario again. Um, somewhere in the audience was supposed to be, I uh, don't think he made it, my nephew, Adam Horwich, who's an undergraduate here at Western, uh, and I don't get to see him that often, and so I was going to take the privilege, remembering what it's like to be an undergraduate, of kind of sadistically singling him out and <laughs> saying that I remembered him when he was still learning to crawl, uh, but uh, I'm afraid I don't have that pleasure, um, but uh, if you run into him, you can let him know that he was, uh, that his ears should be burning. Um, I'm also uh, especially honored to have met and to have in the audience uh, Mr. Coxford, whose generosity and continuing intellectual interest and commitment have made this day and this lecture possible. Um, I understand he's a former trustee of the university. Uh, most of the public presence of the trustees at the University of Alabama, oddly enough, doesn't involve disquisitions on the rule of law, but usually has something to do with the University of Alabama football team, um, as Andrew's introduction suggests. There's no lecture associated with the board or former chairs of the board of trustees at Alabama that I'm aware of, but we do have a lovely statue of Nick Saban on campus. <laughs> uh, that's nice, but I, I do prefer this, and I, I thank and congratulate Mr. Coxford on contributing in this way to the intellectual life of the university. Let me say a word of thanks finally to uh, my host and friend, Andrew who I did know back when we were both learning to crawl, albeit uh, pub crawl, uh, <laughs> and to Amelia Hugel and Teresa Bourne and all the other people who helped make this event happen. So the title of the talk is Honor uh, the Oath and the Rule of Law, and I should note that in deference to the Canadian location of the talk, I've added the U back to the word honor, despite my somewhat assimilated American ways. Um, a lot of what I have to say here was written with the United States and its constitution and laws and legal and political culture in mind. And I have a little anecdote about that for you. A number of years ago, I uh, enjoyed my first and I think last dose of genuine public fame, at least until today, when I appeared on the game show Jeopardy. Uh, what's more, I'll boast, I was a one-day winner before losing terribly the next day. Uh, and you may know that Alex Trebek likes to do a little patter with the guests, with each guest after the first commercial. Um, and you may not know that the contestants, kind of like talk show hosts, are required before the show to write up a list of you know, funny topics that might be suitable for that 30 seconds of small talk. And given our Canadian brotherhood, I guess, uh, I told Alex that it was interesting to be teaching American constitutional law for a living to American law students despite being Canadian. And I told them that when the students and I go through the constitutional text together and we read the preamble to the Constitution, I always say to them, you the people of the United States. <laughs> um, so those of you who follow at least American presidential politics, if nothing else, may appreciate that there are special reasons right now to think about the continuing importance of something like honor to the legal and political order there. Uh, but what I have to say, uh, and the larger, I hope, book project of which this will ultimately be a part, although it draws a, certainly a great deal on American law and history and legal culture specifically, has application in other modern liberal democracies and constitutional orders, I think. Uh, so I, will, I do hope you'll bear with me if my examples are more likely to involve Abraham Lincoln or the late Justice Scalia than, say, Wilfred Laurier or Chief Justice McLaughlin. Uh, and frankly, I would try to draw in Canadian examples, but I'm getting old and long in the tooth, uh, and I've been away from home for too long. I, I'm, I still think Drake is a kind of waterfowl, so I'll, <laughs> I'll stick with what I know. Um, let me start with a kind of historical and cultural coincidence that I've been reflecting on for the, for the last little while. Uh, in 1960, Robert Bolt premiered the play for which he is still best known, A Man for All Seasons. Earlier forms of the play had been performed first as a 
radio show in 1954, <clears throat> and then on TV in 1957. But the full version of the play did not have its first performance until 1960. It was a tremendous hit on both sides of the Atlantic and was just as successful when a movie version premiered in 1966. As a matter of fact, I just downloaded it again for the trip. Um, so its premiere and its popularity occurred well into the series of significant social changes that characterized that decade, but before they had perhaps really hit critical mass. And the subject of A Man for All Seasons is Thomas More, or St. Thomas More, who became and then resigned from the office of Lord Chancellor. Uh, and it's about his conflict with King Henry VIII over the king's wish to put aside his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. That's Aragon, not Aragorn for younger people in the audience and Mary Anne Boleyn. All of this uh, stuff is better known now because of the TV show The Tudors and the retelling of this tale uh, from the rather different perspective of Thomas Cromwell, the agent of Moore's doom in Hilary Mantel's wonderful book Wolf Hall. In Bolt's romanticized telling, however, Moore is the hero martyr of the story. And at the center of that story is an oath and Moore's refusal to swear to it, potentially on pain of death. Moore is a skilled and clever lawyer and tries every legal means of avoiding his martyrdom, swearing what he can swear, resigning his office and surrendering the chain of the Lord Chancellor, remaining silent when pressed for his reasons to refuse to swear the oath, declaring the king the head of the church in England in the marriage to Catherine illegitimate, uh, and making legal arguments of the kinds that law students learn in this building today still to massage the meaning of that silence. At the state trial that ends the play, for instance, um, Cromwell tells the jury that Moore's silence on the matter should not be viewed as silence at all, but as the most eloquent denial of the king's title. Moore answers, and I rather like this, the stage directions say, with some of the academics' impatience for a shoddy line of reasoning. Uh, he says, not so, Master Secretary. The maxim is qui tacit consentire. The maxim of the law is silence gives, gives consent. If, therefore, you wish to construe what my silence betokened, you must construe, construe that I consented, not that I denied. And as a sometime teacher of uh, statutory interpretation, I must add, I'm delighted to see that what you learn in law school and in that class actually is relevant, even saves lives. Well, not in this case. Moore is emphatically a skilled lawyer then. And at one point, emphasizing the importance of the precise language of the bill passed by Parliament, containing the oath that he may have to swear, and read the statute is not only the first thing every professor tells his students about statutory interpretation, but usually the second and third as well. Moore says, God made the animals to show him splendor, as he made animals for their innocence and plants for their simplicity. Man he made to serve him wittily in the tangle of his mind. If he suffers us to fall to such a case that there is no escaping, then we may clamor like champions if we have the spittle for it. But it's God's part, not our own, to bring ourselves to that extremity. Our natural business lies in escaping, in using our wit to avoid that final confrontation between legal obligation and individual conscience. In a preface to the published version of the play, Bolt writes that Moore had an adamantine sense of his own self, knew where he began and left off, what area of himself he could yield to the encroachments of his enemies and what to the encroachments of those he loved. Since he was a clever man and a great lawyer, he was able to retire from those areas in wonderfully good order. Moore does his best to live within society according to its forms and rules, and not only to live within the law, but to find safety there. And yet, in the end, he cannot avoid the final decision that leads to his martyrdom. Or rather, he could. He could avoid it by simply crossing his fingers and saying the oath. But that he will not or cannot do. Bolt, again, in his words, at length, he was asked to retreat from that final area where he located his self, 
And there this supple, humorous, unassuming, and sophisticated person, set like metal, was overtaken by an absolutely primitive rigor and could no more be budged than a cliff. Or as Moore says later in the play, when a man takes his oath, or an oath, he's holding his own self in his own hands, like water. And if he opens his fingers then, he needn't hope to find himself again. I've told the tale at length, and although there's much historical truth at its heart, it is also a tale, a dramatic story, a historical fiction. And the point for our purposes is that well into the modern era, it was a hit, almost inexplicably. A man is asked to speak a legal formality in a society in which almost every other man of position has done so, and in which all view it as a formality, and one which, moreover, is necessary for survival in politically treacherous times, uh, but which, once said, will be little remarked upon, little believed, or cared about by anyone. He does as much as he can to conform or to avoid the requirements, the compromises uh, of his time. And finally, he finds something, just an oath, just a form of words, on which he cannot compromise. And so, having sought to avoid the confrontation, at the final point, he embraces his death with a will. All of this apparently had some quality, some connection to modern life and modern views of the self that audiences could appreciate. And now here's the other half of that coincidence. A few years later, not much later, in 1970, the sociologist Peter Berger published a famous and influential article called On the Obsolescence of the Concept of Honor. The article begins as such. Honor occupies about the same place in contemporary usage as chastity. An individual asserting it hardly invites admiration, and one who claims to have lost it is an object of amusement rather than sympathy. Both concepts have an unambiguously and I stress the unambiguously, an unambiguously outdated status in the Weltanschauung of modernity. Berger did not view this as an absolutely good thing, but that it had happened, he thought, unquestionable. Indeed, he said, the contemporary denial of the reality of honor is so much a part of a taken-for-granted world that a deliberate effort is required to even see it as a problem. Similarly, in her wonderful book, Liberalism with Honor, Sharon Krauss writes that the long language of honor seems obsolete today. We rarely speak of honor today, she observes. The language of honor went out of fashion with the French Revolution, along with powdered wigs and silk hose with breeches. These days, honor seems quaint and obsolete, even frivolous, and it makes us vaguely suspicious. And modern Democrats, even more than others, have reason to distrust honor because the distinctions it draws seem to run afoul of democratic dignity. Now, on the face of it, Bolt and Berger are talking about two somewhat different things, the oath on the one hand, honor on the other. And yet, as I'll suggest today, the two are closely related. Moreover, oaths even more than honor depend, at bottom, on concepts and beliefs that for many are even more obsolete, even more unavailable today, and without which the taking of an oath seems like the mere trappings of ceremony, and the idea of dying for one seems still more far-fetched and distant from the actual administration of government by its officials. Yet Berger accurately captured a view of honor's obsolescence that characterized his time. And Krauss's book, published in 2002, suggests accurately, I think, that Berger's views are still widely held, at least, or maybe especially, in academe. Also, and yet, however, Bolt's story of more, of the centrality of the oath, the importance of standing to our tackle as best we can when faced with an unavoidable conflict between a legal oath, a legal vow, and one's very self clearly resonated with the public. And its continued popularity 
and references to it in, among other places, the legal academic literature, suggests it still has some purchase or attractiveness. So how can both be true? And why, as Professor Peter Olsthorn notes, has there been a notable increase in attention in recent years by, among others, philosophers uh, and political theorists to the concept of honor, with the, perhaps the best known example being the philosopher Kwame Anthony Appiah's 2010 book, The Honor Code. And if there is a renewed interest in honor, what might that say that is relevant to the rule of law and its administration by judges, legislators, executive actors, and other public or legal officials? Quite a lot, I want to say. Uh, now, this talk is only part of a larger project, what I hope will be a book called The Oath and the Constitution. And it's only just a part of a part, really an introduction to the idea. And there's a, another caveat. Uh, I think the relationship between honor, oaths, and the rule of law is significant and deserves more attention. And that honor is a subject ripe for refitting for a modern age. Or perhaps conversely, that our modern age must be refitted to make room for and, so to speak, to give more honor to a revised conception of honor. But it turns out that although I think we can learn a lot from this, much that we will learn will not issue in particular legal outcomes or judicial decisions, particular opinions in cases, or actions, passing or rejecting an act in the legislature, enforcing or not enforcing executive power, and so on, at least not in any clear one-to-one -one, uh, way. What it will give us is, I think, a different sense of the stakes uh, and of the relationship between lawyers, judges, and legal officials to the rule of law uh, and to each other. Uh, and perhaps, although I'll have less to say about this today, uh, perhaps of the role that citizens themselves have to play in this system. That is important, to be sure, but it's not a way of justifying or predicting particular decisions. It's not a clue that solves individual mysteries or a key that unlocks certain doors. It's more like a sense of the path that we must walk and how we must walk it. And what it says is that despite frequent, if rather general, talk to the contrary, the rule of law is not and ultimately cannot be uh, impersonal, nor is it enough to think of the rule of law as a matter of figuring out by some process of perhaps abstract reasoning the principles and values that fill in the term justice and then setting up a system that uh, perhaps in a desired state ensures their almost automatic achievement. There is rather an ineluctable personal element to the law and its administration, one that is simultaneously about one's own virtues uh, and desires and ambitions and about one's sense of one's official role. Uh, it's honor that ties together private virtues, qualities and desires and public roles and offices. The vehicle well, the placeholder, really, in my thinking, although I, I think it can be seen as more than that, that puts that connection into operation is the oath. And if we can't revive the, the kind of sense of the importance of oaths that animated Thomas More and that led to his martyrdom, we can and should reflect more on what they stand for, what they mean and can mean for individual legal officers uh, and interpreters. In an important sense, they give personality to the law and motive energy to the rule of law. So let's consider, uh, sometimes rework a little, a couple of these basic themes, starting with honor. <clears throat> it's a, a hard term to define, but a lot of interesting work has been done on it in the last few decades by people across disciplines. And it's widely agreed that honor is a, a Janus-faced phenomenon. According to the anthropologist Julian Pitt Rivers, someone's honor is, quote,
quote, the value in his own eyes, but also in the eyes of his society. It is his estimation of his own worth, his claim to pride, but it is also the acknowledgement of that claim, his excellence recognized by society, his right to pride. Alexander Welsh, who recently wrote a, a fine book called What is Honor? A Question of Moral Imperative, uh, takes a somewhat similar approach but suggests something like the reverse, that rather than thinking of honor as someone's value in his own eyes but also in the eyes of society, we need to reverse the order and think of it as someone's value in the eyes of his society uh, but also, uh, or perhaps and also, in his own eyes. Honor, in short, has both an internal and an external aspect and is always importantly relational. Our assessment of our worth in the eyes of others is, as Olsthorn says, basically external honor internalized. In the ancient uh, and still, indeed in many respects, newly consequential taxonomy of the virtues of human excellence by Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics, honor is not itself precisely a virtue. It is rather a prize for virtue, a recognition and according of respect to those who exemplify human excellence. Honor thus encourages a person to act virtuously, even if virtue must be uh, its own reward and must be undertaken for right motives. It holds out a promise of recognition that can sometimes lead the individual to forsake simple self-interest in order to pursue principled ends. The long recognized problem with honor is that it does not in itself tell us what constitutes virtuous conduct. Because it depends on distinctions, on treating some but not all people as part of a particular honor group, uh, and some people within the smaller or larger community as acting in a way that merits special recognition, it encourages exclusivism. Because effective honor groups are usually small, it encourages, or at least has been grounded on, existing social phenomena like aristocracy and other social inequalities. It does not treat every person as intrinsically worthy of honor, which is why we have, for the most part, and this is the point of Berger's classic article on the obsolescence of honor, and for that matter of recent work by your former Coxford lecturer, Jeremy Waldron, we have for the most part shifted to thinking about intrinsic equal human dignity as the most important quality <clears throat> while relegating honor to the aristocratic past. It is often associated with a particular set of norms and conduct, sometimes reticulated and regulated in fine distinctions, as in the, the code duello, the set of rules that governed how and when one was to fight a duel of honor, uh, rather than general, universal, and reciprocal moral principles of the kind that we might generate through something like uh, Kantian philosophy. And as the dueling example suggests, it is often associated uh, with violence. Um, so there is some question whether these are simply historically contingent examples, but also some concern that those examples and those past evils uh, cannot effectively be extricated from honor, and so it makes sense to retire it. Uh, and yet, what might honor give us that, for instance, a general view of the impersonality of the rule of law might not, or a general view of equal human dignity might not. Well, motivation still matters. It is certainly right that citizens are, ought to be, entitled to be seen as having intrinsic equal worth. Uh, but it is not always as clear that that status or the enjoyment of that status is a spring to human conduct, is a spring to general and not just specific 
political action. Political energy still matters. It is not enough that people passively or generally seek a particular state of equilibrium in the society. Uh, it is necessary that on some occasions they be moved to fight more directly, more strenuously, and at greater cost for particular principles or for the maintenance of the system of law that they have. Honor is capable of adding some of this motive energy, some of this um, uh, motivation and political agency to the action of individual citizens uh, and is capable of helping us better understand and perhaps channel and constrain the motives, the ambitions, the desires of those people who are more directly charged with administering the law. So honor is especially important for office holders. Um, it is possible, at least I think Krauss argues so and does so effectively, to attempt to retrieve honor and to um, preserve those values of energy and agency that it potentially provides in society uh, while reconceiving it at least somewhat in terms of democratic virtues. Right? Here, in a sense, the fact that honor is not self-defining, the fact that the virtues seen as attached to the honorable person and his or her conduct um, can be and must be filled in from existing or surrounding norms uh, is an advantage here. Right? It is entirely, I think, possible to think about the values of uh, decency, integrity, uh, and other right conduct, um, other conduct that characterizes the kind of person worthy of being honored uh, in terms of and consistent with larger liberal democratic norms. Now while we might have one set of concerns about inequalities among or distinctions between individual citizens, we have at the same time to account for uh, the at least minimal fact that some people have specific roles, um, delegated roles in society as office holders, that people are appointed to judgeships, people are motivated to run for election, and if elected are vested with the exercise of authority and power. And so in doing so, it's important both to motivate honorable people to run, to seek office, to be willing to take on a judicial role, for instance, despite the sacrifices involved, uh, to find ways to channel and constrain those individuals that do not necessarily partake of the prolixity of a legal code, and that, in fact, cannot, because one of the striking qualities of the officers charged with maintaining and administering the law and the rule of law is that many of their decisions are either unreviewable or discretionary or involve making choices among a host of plausible options generally consistent with the law. So we need more than simply the hope that we can turn the rule of law, as it were, into a statute. Um, the idea that office holders can both be motivated to run for office by some love of the um, due recognition and respect uh, to which we attach the label of honor, uh, and that that may uh, motivate them to act properly is, I think, uh, a long-standing idea, one that appears particularly strikingly uh, and for a couple of reasons in the early American Republic. In fact, it's quite remarkable if you read histories of the concept of fame and of ambition that it is viewed largely for religious reasons as, uh, as a sin or at least as a, a vice in the period leading up to the revolutionary era 
uh, and then suddenly undergoes a rather dramatic transformation. So that Alexander Hamilton called the love of fame the ruling passion of the noblest minds, the spur and goad that urges some to act, and here I'm drawing on the uh, historian Douglas Adair, with a nobleness and a greatness that their earlier careers had hardly hinted at. This is one reason Krauss is so interested in her work to revive honor in the liberal age, because she sees it as important that there must be uh, the kinds of incentives and values that, at least from time to time, can motivate not just average democratic citizens, uh, but um, I won't say naturally aristocratic, uh, but exceptional characters. Uh, and motivate them to, to serve the public wheel. Um, so the love of fame was a great motivator for many of the, and I think justly uh, praised and famed um, early members of the American Republic, early leaders of the American Republic. Uh, and that love of fame was, again, channeled into or tied with uh, a close concern with honor, with not just public recognition, but due and appropriate public recognition. That their self-conception should be married to the conception that others had of them. And this made sense, as the historian Joanne Freeman writes, uh, because the society, at least from that perspective, and notwithstanding many other things we might say about its uh, inegalitarian nature, uh, was nevertheless vastly more egalitarian for these individuals than it had been, and vastly more destabilized than it had been. Right? Suddenly there was no clear, existing, fixed marker of social rank of the kind that it existed when there was a, a British aristocracy. And so the making of reputations in a democratic age, the, the elevation of some people in the public eye, was an important and also much uh, contested quality. But importantly, it was and was seen to be tied to the notion of political office, tied to and yoked to the notion of political office. Um, so fame was not simply a matter of open notoriety, but it was rather fame or due honor in the performance of a recognized and delimited set of duties. Uh, and indeed, the framers of the Constitution, and I hope that doesn't sound uh, too foreign, we get used to talking in those terms in the States, I know, um, as designers thought about this, most famously, uh, in Federalist 51, which no matter what country you live in is a, a magnificent piece of political writing, James Madison talks about the value of making ambition counteract ambition through the separation of powers. So it's not simply that individuals' ambition will be set against each other, but rather that people's reputations will be tied to the performance of their office and to the due recognition of the importance of their institution, be it the legislature, the executive branch, the judiciary. Uh, and in that way, their public, well, their public and private reputation, their public and private honor will be yoked together and in the service of the performance of their constitutional office, and when necessary, in the resistance of encroachment by other offices. So once we bring in the office, I think it's pretty clear to see where oaths enter in and how they relate potentially or fill much the same function as honor. What is an oath? Well, in its classic form, it involves at the minimum uh, a declaration involving both the swearer and the person before whom he swears, usually an official, often the sovereign, uh, and God. God is brought in as a witness to the promise. Um, but it's important to see it as more than an ordinary promise, not just because um, the divine witness is invoked. It's rather that the invoking of God and, or whatever other 
value might fill in uh, that role today, um, signifies the seriousness and the nature of the promise made. Uh, unlike most promises, oaths are performative acts. Right? They signify and instantiate the promise being made. And in the case of oaths of office, uh, they literally instantiate the office holder as the person exercising power. Right? The office is always open. There is always a president of the United States. But with the act of taking the oath publicly, seriously, solemnly, solemnly, excuse me, that power devolves upon, settles with a particular individual for that term of office. The oath involves not just a promise to perform or a promise to make an effort to perform, but a commitment of self in a way that is not characteristic of most promises. Oaths are generally connected, if anything, or likened, if anything, to marriage vows, both in the sense that saying I do is what constitutes the couple as a married couple, and in the sense that you are making a commitment to live out an identity as a married person with all the moral seriousness uh, that that entails. So in the same way, an oath of office is a commitment of one's self to a particular duty, to a particular office, which usually involves a rather complex set of defined duties, powers, and responsibilities. Uh, and one is tying one's self to one's role as a public officer uh, and one's public reputation to that office. So you are saying, in essence, my character will be that of the office that I hold. And conversely, how I perform in office will be the verdict that you render toward me. Uh, particularly today, strikingly differently perhaps uh, than in, say, ancient Rome, where offices were frequently entitled to automatic honors. Uh, you're saying that how you do in the office will dictate who you are or how you are thought of to the public, how you are thought of in the eyes of others. And you're connecting, as honor is always Janus faced, your self-conception to that conception. The founders, again, recognized this, uh, although they certainly were drawing on a long and, I should say, often troubled history of oaths of office. Uh, nevertheless, uh, they thought that despite that troubled history, oaths continued to be important, although they modified them in one important sense. Uh, but they did include them. And so Article 6 of the United States Constitution, which is well worth uh, taking a look at, it's short, if that's uh, an inducement, um, requires every office holder, all judges, all federal office holders, and every, uh, every person holding an office or public trust in the states to swear an oath, swear or affirm, an oath to support the United States Constitution. Uh, and the president has an oath of his own or her own. Article 2 of the Constitution has what we call the Presidential Oath Clause, uh, which, uh, and rather strikingly, has somewhat different language, may oblige the president to a different sense of office and to a different sense of obligation. Uh, but every office holder in the United States swears a constitutional oath. For that matter, Andrew mentioned I worked as a law clerk to a federal judge. When I did so, and notwithstanding that I was and am Canadian, I swore an oath to support the Constitution of the United States and to comport myself accordingly. Certainly every person in this audience who has taken or will take, um, and I'm not sure of its current status, but the barrister's oath or other lawyer's oaths knows what the solemnity of that occasion is like or should be like. So what does that say? What does the centrality of constitutional oaths say about the United States and about the holding of office in at least that liberal democracy? Well, first, uh, as many have noted, uh, it is seen as one, f one aspect, perhaps, of the way in which constitutionalism itself in the United States is constitutive of the national identity, right? the way in which uh, one's identity as an American citizen 
comes not, maybe even not at all, from chances of birth or blood, um, although certainly uh, that has uh, happened, uh, but from an individual commitment, an, in an individual promise or vow to be an American, uh, which includes some notion of loyalty to the Constitution. Uh, it is, perhaps more importantly for our purposes, constitutive of the identity of office holders under the laws of the United States. Right? Again, whether state, local, federal, from the president to the Supreme Court, and so on. Um, and in that sense, each of them individually has staked their honor on the defense of, on the support of the United States Constitution, right? which I make not as a point of American exceptionalism, but rather to suggest that their identity as members of this particular legal liberal democracy is constituted as a part of their identity and connected to their individual reputations as office holders. So in that sense, and this is really the key of the argument, the fusion of public and private virtue, the fusion of those public qualities that we think of as integral to the rule of law and those private aims, sparks, desires, motivations, ambitions, and virtues that we think of as constituting the human individual as a moral subject. Are, uh, the, these two are fused, and they're fused through the mechanism of the oath, or at least the oath um, represents, stands in for that fusion, uh, and the mechanism uh, that ties the two together ultimately is, again, a kind of reconceived sense of public or democratic honor, right? particularly for the office holder. So what are the implications of this understanding, of what we might call an oath-centered understanding of the Constitution, at least the American Constitution? Um, perhaps the uh, implications for any understanding of a constitutional order that makes promises to obey that order, uh, and particularly performances of those promises to obey, a central part of the ceremony, the tradition, the culture uh, of office holding uh, in those cultures. I should say, uh, I point you to, for those who are kind of interested in the general subject or how it plays out in the United States, a, a recently published, I think just this month, excellent article by a young legal scholar named Richard Ree called Promising the Constitution, where he tries to lay out at least one picture of what he calls promissory constitutionalism. Well, for me, the central implication, and I said earlier, it suggests a path that we walk rather than uh, a set of clear answers to legal questions, is that the understanding of the Constitution is an indefeasible personal act, that every officer has an indefeasible personal obligation to take seriously and independently the act of constitutional interpretation. Certainly in a, a law-centered uh, environment, and in the United States it's often a, particularly a court-centered and a Supreme Court-centered environment, most arguments are arguments about why we should feel comfortable or feel comfortable again with judicial review, about why people who fail to obey or honor the promises of courts uh, are acting lawlessly. Uh, but it's not clear to me that that is um, the right or best understanding or that that understanding uh, is a natural one. Uh, it comes up in the classic case of Marbury versus Madison where Chief Justice Marshall uses the oath clause of the Constitution to argue that naturally judges have a power to review acts of Congress for their consistency with the Constitution uh, and must therefore be able to strike them down, must have a duty to strike them down uh, where they conflict. That's true as far as it goes, perhaps, uh, but as was pointed out almost immediately upon the issuance of that opinion, every officer in the United States takes the same duty to the oath. 
The, the point here is not so much to diminish the importance of judges, uh, but to change the relationship of moral seriousness that other office holders have with the Constitution. Uh, to ensure that we do not simply think of judicial review as the kind of backstop that allows legislators uh, to pass a law with more or less casualness about whether the law is constitutional on the grounds that the court will be able to preserve them, that if it's truly a bad decision, then judicial review will catch it out. Rather, it is a, both a decision that Congress or the President or any other legal actor must take seriously and one that they must indefeasibly take seriously and cannot, in effect, delegate to others. So the, uh, and, uh, let me uh, close, I think, on more or less that notion. It does not prevent us from having constitutional conflicts. It is not a, a theory or an understanding of the rule of law uh, that assigns the final decision-making order to a particular institution. Uh, but what it does, I think, is personalize the understanding of what the law is or requires in every office holder, and I think should carry a corresponding duty of citizens to be morally serious monitors of the conduct of office holders, just as an audience at a wedding often promises to take seriously and to be, in effect, a part of that community that attempts to ensure that the married couple has a long and healthy marriage. So I think citizens, including those who have never sworn an oath to that effect, have a kind of an honor-bound obligation to maintain, police, uh, and appropriately channel the reputation of those public officers. But the important thing, I think, is to think of the rule of, well, of constitutionalism at least, as an indefeasibly individual enterprise to which, like Thomas More, each officer, in a sense, has staked himself uh, and which cannot be surrendered. To make it the kind of commitment for which martyrdom seems like, if not uh, an immediate or necessary consequence, at least one that they ought ultimately to be willing to face. And happy to talk more about potential problems or, or implications. Thank you.